Welcome to Transformed by Grace, an in-depth Bible study of God's Word presented by the Berean Bible Society. Join us each time on this station as Pastor Kevin brings the transforming message of God's grace revealed through the Holy Scriptures. noticed two men with flashlights moving suspiciously around his dairy pasture just before midnight on July 24, 2002, Bill ventured out to confront the intruders. As he approached the shadowed figures, a familiar voice broke through the darkness. Is that you, Bill? came the voice of Sean Isgan, an engineer and longtime acquaintance of Bill's. There's been an accident in the Kew Creek mine. Nine men are missing. We haven't got much time. Bill's reply came immediately, how can I help? On that night in July 2002, coal miners working in the Q Creek mine in Somerset County, relying on outdated maps, mistakenly bored through a wall that they thought was hundreds of feet thick, but it was not. As a result, 72 million gallons of frigid water rushed into the mine. 18 miners scrambled to escape a watery grave Nine could not get out in time. A rescue operation swung into furious motion immediately. The nine miners were trapped 240 feet below the surface in a chamber that was only four feet high. The first thing rescuers did was drill holes to provide air to the men. Others worked to drill holes to pump water out of the mine. Finally, at 10.15 p.m. Saturday, July 27th, rescuers used a drill, using a drill, punched a hole into the mine about 300 feet from the miners. They lowered a microphone and a speaker in the hole and learned that all nine were alive. Then using a 22-inch wide cage-type cylinder, the rescuers were able to retrieve the miners one at a time. They had been trapped underground for over 77 hours, but all nine miners survived. And the site at Bill Arnold's farm is now a memorial to the rescue. Like those trapped miners were helpless, cut off, in darkness, completely dependent on someone else to rescue them, unable to change their own circumstance, that is our spiritual condition outside of Christ and our sins. But Christ came to this dark world to save sinners, to rescue us from our helpless and hopeless state by His cross and resurrection. And at the cross, as the Savior was made sin for us, making the sacrifice that would provide us with our salvation, the Father turned and forsook His Son, causing Christ to cry out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Matthew 27, 45 reads, Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. Mark 15, 25 tells us, And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. Our Lord was crucified at the third hour, which was 9 a.m. For the first three hours of Christ being on the cross, it was normal daylight. But then Matthew tells us here that there was darkness over all the land from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, meaning that from noon until 3 p.m. for three hours, there was a darkness over the land, and midday became midnight. Matthew writes that beginning at noon, there was darkness over all the land. And that begs the question, how widespread was the darkness? Was it just over all the land of Israel? Or was it global darkness over all the land of the whole earth? To answer this question, first it's important to note that the Greek word for land in this verse is translated as earth in 165 times of the 213 New Testament occurrences. Luke 23:44 is one of those instances regarding this same event. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. 
The word earth is translated from the exact same Greek word translated as land here in Matthew 27, 45. Also, Luke 23, 45 further states, and the sun was darkened. Since the sun was darkened, I believe that means the whole world was darkened. So between the word land referring to the earth and the sun being darkened, we can say that it was global darkness. And as Christ was dying for the sins of the world, so the whole world went dark. Also, Phlegon, a Roman historian at that time, wrote this. In the fourth year of the 202nd Olympiad, there was an extraordinary eclipse of the sun. At the sixth hour, the day turned into dark night, so that the, so that the stars in heaven were seen, and there was an earthquake. This darkness, though, like what he said, was not any natural eclipse. This was a supernatural darkness brought on by the fact that Christ was made sin for us at the cross. The darkness was when the Father was pouring out his wrath and crushing his Son, as prophesied in Isaiah 53.10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Darkness in Scripture often represents judgment, such as we read in Amos 8, 8 and 9, when God's judgment and punishment was prophesied for Israel. Shall not the land tremble for this, and every one mourn that dwell therein? And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord God, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the clear day. You see God's judgment also in the three days of darkness that was brought upon Egypt in the ninth plague. Exodus 10, 21-23 reads, And the Lord said unto, unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. And Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven, and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days. That is the kind of darkness that was over the earth for three hours when Christ was made sin and judged by the Father. It was not a normal darkness, but it was, it was a fearful, thick darkness which may be felt as Exodus says, a darkness in which people could not see one another. In the ninth plague in Egypt, a three-day period of darkness was followed by the final plague of death, death of the firstborn or death of the Passover lamb as the substitute. Similarly, very much so, at the cross, a three-hour period of pitch-black darkness was followed by death, the death of the substitute, the true Passover lamb. 1 John 1.5 tells us that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. In His judgment of Christ, the sin-bearer, the Father who is light, turned away from Him and forsook Him, and this resulted in darkness. And the void remain, remaining from God forsaking and withdrawing from the sun was a powerful, thick darkness which could be felt. This reminds us of the darkness that the lost and unbelieving will experience in hell for eternity as they are separated from God's presence and are judged for their sins. Jude describes it as to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And our Lord spoke of the unbelieving being cast out into outer darkness. Darkness accompanies God's judgment of sin, and the darkness at Calvary was a visible sign of the judgment that was being poured out on God's Son when he took our sins on himself and was made a curse for us. And Matthew Henry made an interesting point when he wrote, 
an extraordinary light from the star gave intelligence of the birth of Christ. And therefore, it was proper that an extraordinary darkness should notify his death, for he is the light of the world. This darkness stopped the mouths of the mocking blasphemers around the cross. For the first three hours during the daylight, they had been deriding and ridiculing the Lord. But when that darkness hit, there was silence around the cross for those three hours. And our Lord was also silent during those 180 minutes, whose soul was in agony as he faced the full measure of the fire of the Father's judgment against the sin of man. Nahum 1.6 states, Who can stand before his indignation? And who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire. This question received its answer in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He alone could stand. At the cross, Christ faced the indignation, fierceness, and fury of God's judgment against our sins. And one commentator put it well when he wrote, Moved by his perfect justice, God's infinite wrath released an eternity of punishment on the incarnate Son, who, as an infinite and eternal person, absorbed the tortures of hell in a finite span of time. Matthew 27, 46 reads, And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? On the high day of the Day of Atonement in Israel's past, two goats were brought before the high priest. One goat was killed and offered as a sin offering. As for the other goat, in a somber ceremony, the high priest would lay his hands on the goat's head and confess the people's sins. The innocent animal would receive the sins of all the Israelites. Then Leviticus 16, 21-22, instructed that they were to send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited, and he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. That goat was carried to the edge of the wilderness and released, banished, forsaken, and abandoned. It was all alone in a land not inhabited. The fulfillment of that picture was Christ at the cross. Christ was in that solitary place all alone when he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Both of those goats picture the cross as Christ was offered as a sin offering, and by imputation he took all our sins on himself, but as a result, he was abandoned by the Father and all alone. For three hours, it had been dark. At noon, it became pitch black dark. At 12.30, it was dark. 1.15, still dark. 2.05, still dark. 2.40, still dark. But then, out of the depths of the darkness at about the ninth hour, or three o'clock in the afternoon, came the anguished voice of the Son of God in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? This cry of Christ gives the meaning of the darkness, just as the darkness gives meaning to his words. The words Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabachthani are Aramaic in origin, the common language of the day. 
Thus, this eternally important question is preserved for us in the original language in which it was spoken by the Lord from the cross. And these words mean, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And they were a direct quote from Psalm 22, 1, and was a prophetic fulfillment of them. Psalm 22 is a messianic psalm written by David, which offers a vivid account of the cross and depicts the suffering of the Messiah 1,000 years before it happened. This is the only time that Christ asked a question from the cross, and there was intensity, fervency, and emotion behind this question from our Lord as verse 46 says that he cried these words with a loud voice. As Christ was bearing the weight of the sin of the world, he experienced the separation from God for the only time in all of eternity. And you can see the separation Christ was experiencing by him crying out, My God, my God. In the first and last statements of the cross, Christ addressed God as Father, but not in this statement. And this is the only time in the Gospels where Christ addressed God without calling him Father. And the repeated name, my God, my God, expressed the Son's profound longing for the Father and his comfort mingled with agony and pain of his separation from him. One author and pastor said, If after a service some Sunday morning, one of the members of my church came to me and said, I never want to see you or talk to you again. He said, I, I would feel pretty bad. And he said, if, But if my wife or my lifelong best friend came up to me and said, I never want to see you or talk to you again. I would be devastated. The longer the love, the deeper the love, the greater the torment of its loss. And with the forsakenness experienced by Christ on the cross, the relational loss between the Father and the Son, who loved each other within the Godhead from all eternity, the torment of that loss was infinitely great. During his earthly ministry, the Lord had said, And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. But now, during the three hours of darkness, even the Father had turned away and left Christ alone. And Christ felt and experienced the awful, terrifying forsakenness of God that we deserved for our sins. Christ was forsaken of the Father that we might not be forsaken by Him in hell, that we might be delivered from that dreadful torment. Author Max Licato wrote this of the abandonment of the Son on the cross. The undiluted wrath of a sin-hating father falls upon his sin-filled son. The fire envelops him. The shadows hide him. The son looks for his father, but the father cannot be seen. My God, my God, why? It was the most gut-wrenching cry of loneliness in history. And it came not from a prisoner or a widow or a patient. It came from a hill, from a cross, from a Messiah. My God, my God, he cried, why did you abandon me? Never have words carried such hurt. Never has one been so lonely. The despair is darker than the sky. These words were the cry of the Son of God who is now experiencing something he had never known in all of eternity, separation from and forsakenness by God the Father. This was more than just Christ felt forsaken. He was literally, actually abandoned by the Father. This cry shouted out to the heavens, 
was met with silence, which underscores the truth of Christ's abandonment. The answer for why the Father forsook the Son is found in Psalm 22. The Lord quoted verse 1 with his question, Why hast thou forsaken me? And in verse 3 of Psalm 22, we read, But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. The Father forsook the Son because his holiness required it. And because God is holy and just, he must punish sin. In Habakkuk 1, 12 and 13, the prophet wrote, Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord my God, mine holy one? Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. There was no way of transferring sin to Christ without also transferring its penalty. Both sin and its punishment were transferred to Christ at the cross. Thus, when the Father, the Holy One, laid on Christ the iniquity of us all, He poured out His wrath and He forsook the Son of His love. And the pure Holy One who cannot look on iniquity had to turn away from His sin-bearing Son. God, who is holy, could not look with favor on His Son when He had become sin for us. The fact that Christ was forsaken and made this cry from the cross teaches us that He took all our sins on Himself and paid for them. And so ultimately, the answer to the Lord's question, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The answer is for you, for me, for us. Christ was forsaken by God so that we could be forgiven. The judgment that should have fallen on us fell instead on him. There's an old gospel song that I've always liked called 10,000 Angels. The lyrics refer to how Christ could have called 10,000 angels to rescue him from the cross. And the chorus says he could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and me. And that is true. He did die alone. For you and me. Like with the darkness, again, we see another aspect of hell's torments that the Lord endured at the cross, which includes being forsaken by the Father. Because if the Father turned his face away from his beloved Son when he became sin, he will certainly turn away from every person who dies in their sins. And like with Christ, God's wrath will be poured out against them, and the comfort of His presence, love, and compassion will be utterly absent. There are many terrible, awful things that will torment those in hell, such as the fire and the flames having no rest, being in utter darkness, the memories and the raging thirst but the worst thing about hell will be that it is the one place where people will be forever forsaken by God, separated from His presence, being in a place where God's goodness and comfort are not present. This brings up a question. Did Christ suffer in hell? The simple answer to this question is no. A common teaching that you can run into is after his crucifixion and death, the Lord's body was placed in a tomb and his spirit went to hell. There he suffered all the torments of hell that we would have suffered, but Satan, death, and hell could not hold him. Acts 2, 24 to 27 is used to support that position. Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. It is taught that because 
Christ was not himself deserving of punishment, that the Lord was resurrected from hell and the grave by the power of God. Some will even go so far as to say that you have to believe that Christ suffered in hell to be saved. But this is a dangerous doctrine and is actually an attack against the cross of Christ. The word hell in Acts 2.27 is translated from the Greek word Hades. Hades is in the center of the earth. At the time of Christ's death, it had two compartments, Abraham's bosom, or paradise, and torment. Christ fully faced the judgment of God against our sins upon his cross during those three hours of worldwide darkness. As he did, Christ experienced the realities of hell at the cross, being separated from and forsaken by the Father. The darkness, the torment, the pain, the thirst, and the fire of God's wrath against sin. Christ was our blessed substitute at the cross. He paid sin's penalty for us there, and he took God's wrath in our place there. When Christ cried out, it is finished, he meant that the payment for sin was complete and paid in full. To say that Christ also needed to suffer the penalty for sin in hell for three days and three nights is to teach otherwise. For three days and three nights, our Lord was in the center of the earth. We learn where his soul went after he died when he told the believing thief on the cross beside him, verily I say unto thee, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Christ did not go to hell when he died. He did not suffer in torment in Hades. His spirit descended into the paradise section of Hades, where the spirit of the penitent thief went also. Three days later, our Lord rose again from the dead, triumphant over sin and death. Thank you again for tuning in to Transformed by Grace. We appreciate your prayer support and the financial gifts. The purpose and mission of the Berean Bible Society is to help you understand the whole counsel of the Word of God. For more information, visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org or give us a call at 262-255-4750. Or if you prefer, write us at the Berean Bible Society, P.O. Box 756, Germantown, Wisconsin, 53022. Now until next time, may you be transformed by God's grace.